Hi there, knowledge hungry friends. We finally reached the part of the tutorial that I know many of you have been looking forward to IO, short for input and output. So far, we've only been talking about software, but now we will finally look a little bit at hardware. In most cases, when working with PLCs and control systems, you want the system to interact with the world in some way. This can be from the simplest case with just a few sensors for temperature and detection of whether a door is open or closed, and maybe opening or closing of a relay, to an advanced case which includes thousands of sensors, motion control of motors, and robots and vision systems using cameras. Personally, it was when the PLC software I wrote was integrated with hardware that I really felt the full power of PLCs. Enough talk, let's get started. When talking about inputs and outputs, you generally talk about having sensors to gather information about your surroundings, and actuators to interact with your surroundings. Examples of sensors might for example be gas sensors, flow meters, leakage detectors, distance sensors, temperature sensors, movement detection sensors, humidity sensors. And examples of actuators might, for example, be conveyor belts, motors in general, heaters, coolers, lasers, pumps, robots. Now our PLC needs a way to interact with all these different objects. For this it requires something referred to as a field bus, which is an interface that connects the PLC to all these sensors and actuators. A field bus is a name for an industrial computer network, used for real-time distributed control. A field bus can be implemented in a wide variety of ways and there are many different ones. A few of the more popular ones are Profinet, CC-Link, Modbus, PowerLink, Eticat, Ethernet IP, CanOpen. Each one has its own set of disadvantages and advantages. For each there is generally one or more companies backing them up and the companies often have economical incentives to do so. In this part I will focus on talking about Eticat, as this is the de facto field bus in Beckhoff PLCs. It was invented by Beckhoff and real-time drivers for it are per default included in every Beckhoff PLC. I will not do any comparison between these in this tutorial. The first reason is that it's outside of the scope for this tutorial, but there is also another reason. There are a few things in the automation industry that get people as engaged and upset as doing comparisons between different field buses. People have their favorites and defend them like it would be a religion or some political party. Also, every company that is backing its respective field bus has invested money into it and of course wants to see some return in this. If you find this interesting, I'll simply leave it up to you to find comparisons on the internet. There are plenty of them if you search. Even though we will only cover Eticat in this tutorial, I'd like to point out that it's possible to do virtually all field buses that are in existence with Twincat. There are both hardware modules and software real-time drivers to do all kinds of field buses, so you are not restricted to Eticat. Eticat was invented by Beckhoff and is thus the natural choice when working with Twincat 3. It also has the tightest integration into Twincat 3 of all the field buses. Again, I'm not going to say which one is the best. I wouldn't even want to say that there is any best, there simply isn't a silver bullet or one size fits all. With this being said, I think it's time for a short introduction to field buses in general, and Eticat in particular. An Eticat network constitutes of one Eticat master and one or more Eticat slaves. The Eticat master is responsible for sending out Eticat telegrams that are intercepted by each Eticat slave. Each Eticat slave reads the data sent to it and also provides its own data to be transmitted back to the Eticat master. While the Eticat master is entirely implemented in software and can be implemented using the standard networking hardware you find in any computer such as your PC, each Eticat slave requires a special chip called the Eticat slave controller. 
Although the requirement that we need special hardware in each Etiquette slave on one side is a big disadvantage, it's also one of the reasons we can get extremely fast cycle times on the bus. I've personally run Etiquette in cycle times of 100 microseconds, but I know it's possible to run even faster than this. Now I will demonstrate how a typical cycle in an Etiquette network could look like. Imagine we have our PLC with an integrated Etiquette master software stack. This would talk to one or several Etiquette slaves. The Etiquette slave is just one component of a device that gives us access to the sensors and actuators. The Etiquette network can consist of many Etiquette slaves. Some of them might be part of a very basic device that only does simple digital inputs and outputs, while others might be part of a very complicated device, such as a robot and a drive for motion control. Each Etiquette slave will have a certain amount of bytes for input and output data. The input and output in these terms is from the perspective of the Etiquette master. This means that input data will be data provided from sensors, and output data is data to actuators. The data for input and output is depending on the application of where the Etiquette slave is being used. Now let's imagine that the Etiquette telegram is like a train, a really fast train, like a Japanese Shinkansen. Always on time and very fast. This train carries output data that will be transmitted to the Etiquette slaves. This data has just been set by the PLC internally by the software that we have written. What happens now is that the train stops at the first station, the first Etiquette slave, and puts a certain amount of data into the Etiquette device. This data can for example be used by the Etiquette slave device for the actuators that are connected to it. At the same time the train is picking up whatever data the Etiquette device has ready for it, which corresponds to the sensor data. Then the Etiquette telegram moves to the next station or Etiquette slave and unloads output data and loads input data on the telegram. This is again repeated for all Etiquette slaves. After visiting all Etiquette slaves, the train returns to the PLC and returns all the input data from the whole Etiquette network to the PLC, which can be used in the Twinka 3 software. You can simply see this whole setup as a brain which corresponds to the PLC, with nerves corresponding to sensors and muscles corresponding to the actuators. Even though we've been running this quite slow, the Etiquette network can run really fast running at speeds less than 100 microseconds cyclically with minimal jitter is not a problem. Now I spent so much time doing this animation that I just have to show it once again, albeit a little faster. The Etiquette field bus is really fast. When you will start working with hardware, you will most likely encounter some form of field bus terminals or boxes. One example of this is the Beckhoff terminal EL1004, which is a 4 channel digital input. Now, digital sounds very advanced, but what it refers to is very simple. Digital means to detect whether we have 24 volt on an input or not. So basically just detection of on or off, for example a door switch or a limit switch. Each one of Beckhoff's EL terminals has an integrated Etiquette slave controller, so it can do Etiquette communication. It's this field bus communication that we are using to get the status of the inputs. There are also terminals to do the opposite. That is, when you want to actuate something with a 24 volt output. The equivalent for this is the EL2004 terminal, which houses four digital outputs. Now, Beckhoff are not the only ones that are manufacturing field bus devices with Etiquette capability. There are many others. One of my favorite devices is one manufactured by the company IFM. 
This is slightly more advanced than the two previous ones as this supports four channels of IO-Link. IO-Link is a bi-directional point-to-point -point industrial communication networking standard for connecting digital sensors or actuators. This is based on a serial protocol so it can exchange a vast set of data between the terminal and the sensor. These are just a few examples of field bus devices. There are thousands of other out in the wild. To actually use field bus devices in Twinket, you have to link the software to the hardware. For inputs, this is defined with a name of the links, the percentage i star characters and the data type of the inputs. Compiling will give you instance variables in the process data image that you can link to the hardware. For outputs, it's done the same way, with the only difference that you use percentage %q star instead. Compiling the code will give you instance variables in the process data image that you can link to the hardware. Once this is done, you can freely use these variables in your code. The final step we need to do to close the loop is to link the variables to the actual hardware. All the real-time capable hardware is presented in the IO object in the Twinket solution. This will require an eTicket master in where we can define our terminals. In this case, the EL1004 and EL2004. These two objects represent the actual physical devices. The only thing that's left for us to do is to link our process data variables to the hardware. In this case, inputs are shown with a yellow icon on both sides, so in our code and in the IO tree, while outputs are shown with a red icon on both sides. I'll show how the linking is done shortly. It's that easy. All right, I think that's enough talk. Now it's time to look at some actual hardware. Hey there, now it's finally, finally time for playing around with a little bit of hardware. So for this setup, I will show you some of the stuff that we're going to use today. First of all, we're going to use a deck of PLC, in this case, a CX5140. Uh, this is a PLC I've been using for, for many years and I've had it here in my home for to learning and understanding stuff. This is basically a standard PC. That's the way I see it. I mean, it has a, a Intel CPU, it has a motherboard, it has a memory, the standard DDR3 or 4 memory here. Uh, it has network ports, everything that you would expect if you just went to the, gro not the grocery store maybe, but if you went to the computer store and bought a PC. The difference is that it, this is an industrial casing, right? So it's made for an industrial environment. First of all, the, the casing is, is quite sturdy. It's done, it's made to be running 24-7. There's other, I mean, other adjustments like it's using 24 volt for the for the power. So you supply this with 24 volt, which is an industrial standard. Other than that, we have the Etiquette slaves here. So these are the back of EL terminals. So you basically have a terminal for any type of sensor. So you have digital inputs, digital outputs, analog inputs like flow meter, analog outputs, and I mean, there's so many different of these terminals. Each and one of these terminals has an Etiquette slave built into them. So that's how the PLC talks to, this, to these terminals. And the way the, the back of PLC does that is by a proprietary interface called the eBus. So you basically wire up your, your sensors here, and then each terminal takes care of providing that information to the Etiquette master so we can get the cycle clean, the process data, which I will show, soon show. In this example, I also have, I have lots of wires here, as you can see, and what I've wired up here is, is a motor. So it's a motor with an encoder. So this terminal here is basically a drive. So for a stepper motor in this case. It's, it's quite impressive that you can actually have so much electronics in such a tiny, tiny casing. I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm terribly sorry for, for all the wiring uh, that I have here. It looks quite terrible. I mean, I'm not an electrician, but I guess this is just what you would expect from, from a software engineer, that the, <laughs> that the cabling looks terrible. What I want to mention now is that we have two network ports here. One is used to connect this PLC to the local network here in my home. This is just so that we can read variables from the PLC, so we can upload new software, so we can do remote desktop. I mean, again, this 
is a standard PC more or less. So it's running the Windows operating system. And because it's running the Windows operating system, it means that we have all the standard services that you would expect. So in this case, you know, you have remote desktop, the, the RDP protocol, for example. But you also have the whole TCP IP stack in Windows, which is all accessible through this network uh, port. For the second network port, I have loaded a real-time network driver for ETCAT. So this port here we will use for ETCAT communication. What this guy is connected to is this IFM IOLink master. So IOLink is a, it's a protocol to communicate with sensors. So it's, it's a special protocol just to get on the lowest level on the factory floor, that is uh, sensors and actuators. And this guy has an ETCAT slave just like all of these terminals, this is the way that uh, we can communicate from the ETCAT master to the ETCAT slave. But at the same time as this is an ETCAT slave, then it's also an IOLink master. So an IOLink master can talk with IOLink slaves, and IOLink slaves are the low-level uh, sensors and actuators. And in this case, we will use a distance sensor. So this is a laser distance sensor. I think that it has a range of 3 centimeters to 3 meters or 2 meters or something like this. And this guy is connected to this guy. And I mean, in this case, it's both are IFM, but it doesn't have to be. IOLink is a standardized protocol and there are many, many manufacturers using IOLink. Why I want to use this particular unit is because I want to show IOLink. I think IOLink is a very capable protocol. It's It provides much more stuff than the usual boring, I want to use the word boring here, terminals, because you know, these digital inputs and digital outputs, they're not very exciting. You actuate 24 volt or you read 24 volt. Well, these are, are, are a little more fun. Uh, this is an IOLink uh, ETCAT slave. So it means that the communication here is ETCAT in, and then you can connect the next ETCAT slave in the chain. So with uh, that being said, I think it's time to write some software to get this guy to talk to our PLC. Now it's time for the best part of the day, a little bit of programming. What I've done here is that I've created a completely empty and new project. In this project, we will add the hardware communication so that we can talk to our sensor. In this case, the IFM0, no, OD5100 or O5D100, something like this. I'm simply gonna start with connecting to the PLC because previously, so far, we've only been running everything locally on, on our virtual machine. Right now, we will run the, on the PLC. And to do that, we need to do something called an AMS connection, so an AD connection so that we can talk ADS with the PLC. I will talk more about ADS in a future part of this tutorial. Right now, it's only important to know that we have to connect to the PLC. And we do that by going to this little icon in our development environment, router, edit routes. So, so far we don't have anything, which is fine as long as we're only gonna develop locally. So as long we're, as we're only gonna put software on a virtual machine or on development uh, machine, then local is fine. But as soon as you want to do connections to any other PLC, you have to go through this window. Click add, enter the IP address of the PLC. In this case, I know it's, uh, it's this IP address because I just connected it here locally Add it to my, to my network here at home. So I will add enter the IP address. We can also do a broadcast search. I mean, there's various ways to do this, but right now I'm just going to enter the IP address of the PLC. It shows up, gives some information about what version of Twinket, what operating system version is running on the PLC and other things. But just click add route, enter the password, the administrator password for the PLC. In this case, it's a one, the standard default backoff password, not the most secure one. Then we have a connection here. Close this window, and now we can suddenly select the PLC as the target. So the PLC was the one that I showed before, this CX5140. So I select this guy, and what we're going to do first is that we're going to do a scan of the inputs and outputs. So this is the first time we're going to work here. We're going to do a scan which basically just detects is there anything connected to this PLC. You do that by right-clicking here, select scan. This gives a warning hint, not all types of devices can be found automatically, yeah, which is true. It, in this case, it will find it automatically. Select OK. And what happens here is that right now uh, on the machine, we're, we're actually looking for all network adapters, what drivers are connected to these various network adapters. So default Twinket will assume that you want to run ETCAT, because again, this is the default field bus on the machine on uh, Twinket 3 PLCs. 
Here I know the COM port here, that's an RS-232 port on the PLC. Uh, I don't know if you notice it, but there's actually an old school 9-pin RS-232 port. We're not going to use that, so we don't need that. And there's two ETHCAT masters here. The first one here, this guy, the VS1, that's usually the eBus terminals. So it's all the terminals to the right of the PLC. You know, all these EL terminals that, that we had attached. We don't want these because we want to use the IFM IOLink master, which was connected on a separate ETHCAT master that was going from the network adapter. So we, we don't want to use this one. We just want to use the one that's connected to this network adapter. So again, this green cable going out from the PLC. Select OK. Scan for boxes. And scan for boxes is basically, hey, do you want me to search for ETHCAT slaves? That's basically what it's asking. Select yes. So activate free run. Uh, this is not so important now, just select yes. And what we can see here is that we have the IFM IO link master detected this AL1330. So again, the AL1330 is, it's this guy that I, that I showed you before. It has been detected. We can go here and here we see all kinds of stuff. So we see some default inputs. We have some state for the ETHCAT slave. But what we're going to do now is that we basically have to tell this guy that, hey, I have this type of sensor connected to port number one because the, the IO link slave, in this case, the, the distance sensor was connected to the first port of the IO link master. So we have to tell this guy that, hey, there's something connected to, to, to this port. And to do that, we have to go here to slots and here we can configure the different channels. So again, if we look at this guy, you see it has four different channels. So we can con connect four different sensors or actuators to this uh, IOLink master. There's other variants with eight or even I think 16 ports if you want that. But yeah, this one supports four. The way you do that is that you go to, to the first channel, which we have in this case, and then you have to define how many bytes are going in and out. So how much process data basically is going from the sensor. So we can define both in bytes and out bytes. So every IOLink slave that's connected to an IOLink master has a predefined set of process data. So it's, it can be one byte, it can be two bytes, four bytes, or I think up to 32 bytes per sensor. To know what our guy is handling, so our IOLink slave, I open up the documentation for the sensor. So this is the sensor that I showed you before, the distance sensor. We go down and we can find, we, I usually go to downloads and then we have a PDF. So IO link interface description. And this is usually a document that, I mean, you're gonna end up, you're gonna read many, many type of documents like this when, when you work with PLC software development, you're gonna look at lo lots of documents for sensors and so this is just something you will have to get used to. In this case, I think IFM, they are, their documentation is really good. So I usually just look and we just want to find how many bytes does the process data define. And here we can see process data input. And it's a total of 16 bits. So it's two bytes of data, whereas 12 bits is the distance. So here we can see the value range is 5 to 200. So that's the value range for our distance sensors. We can measure stuff between 5 and 200 centimeters. But we also got some, get an extra bit here. And this extra bit is quite good to have, actually, this guy, because it tells us whether the value range is correct or not. So basically whether we we have a correct measurement or not, or a measurement that we can trust or not. So this, we also, we're also interested in this because for example, let's assume we have some dirt in the sensor or the sensor is displaced. So it's not pointing where it's supposed to point. We want to know that, but here we have two bytes. So then we know we can go back to Twincat and we can see that, okay, we don't need 32 bytes, 16, and the lowest one is four bytes, which is fine. Then we'll just say, hey, we want four bytes, but we're just gonna skip two of those. We're just gonna take two of these bytes. And we can also deactivate the channel on the IOLink master. So we'll do that first. We'll select IOLink channel two. We deactivate it like this. So first delete, select deactivated, delete, deactivated. And this guy we delete and we say, hey, four bytes. And the interesting thing is that what happens here is that we get this four bytes. So we say four, the first channel, we're gonna have four bytes of data. 
So for example, if you had another sensor here, let's say we had a, I don't know, some power measurement device, usually that provides you much, much, much more data than, than two bytes. Then you would want to, yeah, then maybe you have 32 bytes. So then you would define, hey, this is a 32 byte channel. And then you would get another channel here with 32 bytes of data. But right now for this part of this tutorial, I will only show you this simple distance sensor. So we have this guy. Next, what we need to do is to write our code to actually get this data. So in the end of the day, what we want is we want uh, the current distance and we want to know whether we can trust the data or not, whether it's valid or not. So we want two data points. So when I usually do, uh, when I start coding, I in this case, we want to have a function block for this, right? Because the sensor, we want to put the related code for this particular sensor here. We can do that by creating a function block and let's just call it what the sensor is called. In this case, the name of the sensor, uh, 05D100. And we can simply just define what the inputs and outputs are for this. So in this case, we don't have any inputs. Well, we have the input bytes. For this demo, I'm gonna make it very simple and simply define that the input bytes are defined inside the function block. I'll get to it so you, you'll see what I mean. But what we want out is the distance. So we can just call it, I mean, this was just a, was, it's a value range in, in discrete values, so it's not a flo floating number, it's between 5 and 200. So let's just make it an integer, call it distance. Uh, and we can just write a comment that it's in centimeters, right? That's, and then we want a boolean that we can call value range uh, valid or in value range, for example, be in value range. Um, yeah, so and we can just say that uh, true equals, what did I say? True e equals uh, active, so that's probably valid. True equals valid. All right, so we have defined, this is what we want out from the function block. Now we need to link these bytes and convert these bytes to this value, right? We would just get two bytes and that doesn't do us any good. We have to convert these two bytes into the values that we're interested in. So first start with declaring the two bytes. And as I showed previously, to get to link the two bytes into our program, we need to use this percentage i star word. So let's just call it a input bytes. That's an array with two bytes. So array one to two of byte. But we want these guys to be linkable so that we can link them to these two bytes here. So it's at percentage i star, which means that when we compile this, we're going to have two bytes in the process data image that we can link to the hardware. But before doing that, I need to create an instance of this function block. So I need to instantiate it in the memory so that we have an actual instance of this object. So simply create it like this and compile. So I will rebuild. What Twinket says here now is, hey, this etcat master, it's, it needs at least a variable linked to any program that's running in a task. And the reason for this is that the etcat master needs to have someone that dictates how fast the etcat master should send out the telegrams, right? Because there's no reason to, to send etcat telegrams faster than we're running our program. So if you have a task that, that's running every 10 milliseconds, then it kind of makes sense to run the etcat master at 10 milliseconds, which means that we will have new data from the etcat field bus every 10 milliseconds. So Twinket just says, hey, I have no idea how fast you want to run etcat right now. Could you please tell me how fast I should run etcat? One thing I want to mention, is that, I mean, right now we're, we're running etcat, but I can just quickly show you that it's very easy to add any other field bus protocol. So if you right click here, you can, it's not just etcat, you have Profinet can open, this Devasnet, this 
Ethernet IP is just basically everything in here. So if you want to have a Profinet driver, for example, I mean Profinet is, is quite common, uh, considering that its inventor is Siemens, which has a big share of the market. You can create a Profinet controller here. So Beckhoff have provided real-time drivers for various field buses that you can use. And you can link these guys to any of the available network adapters that you have installed that are supported by this driver. Going back to this guy, I have compiled this program now. So we have a main program, but we need to link these bytes both to get the data. So we, both so that we will get the data coming from the IOLink slave, but also so that the ETCAT master knows how fast it should run this task. And in, in, in this case, in this case, our PLC task is running at 10 milliseconds. So that's the speed of which ETCAT is going to run. Now that we have compiled our program, we have this guy here. And here is where you link the bytes to the ETCAT master. So as you can see here, the name here is main. So it's the main program. The instance of the function block that we created, I just call it FB, yeah, it's this name. And then dot, and this, then it's this array that we have defined here. And now we can click on this guy, click link to, and we can link them to these input byte zero and one. So we're gonna skip input byte two and three. We're just gonna link zero and one because we only need two bytes because the sensor only sends two bytes. We do that. Then we do the same thing with this. And this is where the magic happens, right? Because if you come to think about it, now we just linked our variables in our code to the field bus, but we didn't have to write any code, any software to get the ETCAT up and running. I mean, the, getting an ETCAT master to work in Twinkat is, is really like, I mean, a, a tiny baby could do it. Okay, maybe not a tiny, a, a very smart tiny baby, or just, let's say a kid could do it. It's very easy. So now we have these guys linked, and we can also see it down here, because you see you have these two arrows here that are indicating that, hey, these two bytes are actually linked to something in the PLC code. Now we have this linked in the PLC code. The next step is that we need to convert these bytes, whatever, whatever these bytes are, into these values. Here we need to go back to the documentation. So here we can see that we have two bytes, which and the two bytes create one word, so 16 bits in total. But we're only interested in 12 of these. The way I think about this is that I want to convert both of these bytes into a separate word and then we can do some bit shifting and moving these bits around to the left and to the right to, to just extract the stuff that, that we're interested in. I mean there's, there's many ways to do this actually. I'm just going to show you one and it's probably not going to be the cleanest and best way but it's going to be one way that I just make up on the go here. <laughs> Okay, so these bytes are, we have two bytes. Let's create a word for each and one of them. So a, a one word, or just, that's not a good name. Word one, and word one, word, and word two, word. Then we put in the first word, we put the first byte. So a byte is eight bits, a word is 16 bits. So there would be an implicit conversion here. I'd recommend you to do an explicit conversion by saying to word. And let's do the same thing for the second byte. So I will just copy this. Right now, the way I think about it is that if, let's draw this. If the first byte looked like this, then if the first byte looked like this, then the word will look like this now. Right, because we only use the eight first bits in the word. And it's gonna be the same here. By the way, when, when doing software development and doing this byte conversions to floats or to integers, I always like to you know draw on a piece of paper or just do comments here so I have a mental map of what's happening with these bits and bytes. And the first thing I will do now is that I will we'll simply, so first we have to make an assumption one assumption I have to make is that this byte is the one that's reached the PLC first. So we have the, this going to the PLC. It's not completely clear here. And we can actually even see it that there's a note here. Siemens PLC swap the high and low byte. Uh, 
and yeah, that's uh, it has to do with this. And anyway, it's not important. We just have to make an assumption of which byte comes first. And I would just say this is byte, the first byte. This is the second byte. So what I want to do is that I want to shift these guys eight bits to the left and then fill these guys to the remaining place. So what I want to do is I want to shift these guys to this position. And I do that with something called shift left. So it's a bit shift. So SHL twinkles. And it's a bitwise left shift of an operand. It basically moves an n amount of bytes. So we do that by saying n word one is equal to shift left, the same one, n word by eight bits, which means that this should look like this now. And everything that's to the right of the bits we're shifting is just going to be filled with zeros, which means that this will be shifted eight positions and then it's going to be zeros to the right. So we've shifted these bytes, these are these bits, eight, eight bits to the left. Uh, for the second byte, we don't have to do anything right now because what we want to do is that we want to OR this byte with this byte while they're in their words to get the complete 16 bits that we're interested in and then we'll mask these out. So what we want to do is that we want to... Let's create a third word. Again, this is not the cleanest code. This can probably be much made much cleaner. What we want to do is that we want to create a third word and OR them with or, or word one with or word two. And what that means is that right now word two looks like this, word one looks like this. In the case that we order, if we order them with each other, they're gonna look like this. We're gonna keep whatever ones are here, and we're gonna keep whatever ones are here. Which means in this case, what we're gonna get is. This. So if you, I mean, again, if I just show you, if I, this is word one, right? So this is word one, oh, no, sorry, word two. This is word one. If I make an or between them, then it's enough that one of them is true for the result to be true. So we will simply have just ones everywhere. But, so we'll end up with this, but, we're not interested in these four bits because these four bits don't hold any data except for this guy that's interesting. But we'll take that later. So what we'll do now is that we'll shift all of this four bits to the right. So n word three is equal to shift uh, right n word three four bits which means we're gonna get end up with um, these are gonna be shifted out to, and it's gonna be filled with zeros here which means we're gonna get this which is exactly what we want so we'll end up with the value the 12 bits that are interesting and now we need to convert this word to the integer so we'll simply do a conversion and distance is equal to n word 3 to int. What we forgot is this b in value range. And there's a very convenient way for us to get this sim single byte or the single bit. And if we look at the documentation, we can see it, it's in the second byte, right? Because this was the first byte, this is the second byte. And it's the first bit in the second byte. And the way you do go about it is that, uh, so we have the second byte here, that we can simply say that b in value range is the second byte dot zero. That means it's the, it's the first bit, because it starts at zero. Zero means first bit, which means it, the, the eight bit in the byte, so the last, so if we wanted this guy here, we would write seven, right? Oops. 
7. We can't write 8, that doesn't work, that doesn't exist. See, we even get a, an error here. It says that 8 is not valid, is no valid bit number. 7 is the highest we can go because a uh, byte only has 8 bits. So I think that's it's not the most pretty code, but I think this will actually work. Well, it depends whether we got the ordering of the bytes right. And what I usually do, if I would do this more professionally, I would actually start by writing unit tests for this. So I would define some test cases and given the different use cases, uh, I would put some tests on it and see that I would get some expected values. Right now we're gonna do it quick and dirty and this might or might not work. And if it doesn't work, I'm pretty sure the only thing we have to do is to swap the, the ones, the one with the two and the two with the one, because then we got these ordering wrong. But I think this is enough to actually test the code. We will test the sensor with a few objects online. We have my bike Stolis, and we have an old computer online, a Commodore 128. In the upper left corner, we have an online view of Twinkit. We can see as we move the sensor around, the values change. If we get within 100 centimeters, then the boolean becomes true. I think it's really fun to play around with hardware. Well, we have now again reached the end. Just as with most of the other things I've been talking about in this tutorial, what I've presented here is just a tiny, tiny, tiny part of what I would like to talk about. This topic is really, really, really big. Anyway, I hope that you feel that you've learned something new and see you in the next part.